Good morning to you this morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. In your bulletin, you'll find a International Day of Prayer prayer bulletin. Okay, it's the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Uh, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ who live other places in our world that are unable to come together and meet like we do every Sunday. And so this is an international day of prayer for them, and we'll be having a time of prayer during our prayer time this morning uh, for all of our brothers and sisters uh, who are persecuted around the world. Also, on the other side of that, you'll see the poinsettia donation form. So if you want to give one in honor or in memory of, of someone, uh, you, can, uh, this, you can have this. This is due no later than 10 a.m. November 14th. What's next Sunday? The 13th. So this will be Monday before 10 that these will be due. So uh, remember that. Uh, have that ready if you'd like to give one. Also, uh, Operation Christmas Child tubs ready to be filled. Uh, we're doing that. Uh, packing is this, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday is our packing day. So uh, come on that Wednesday evening. Come ready to pack and work and let's get these done. Uh, it'll be an exciting evening. It always is. It's fun to be uh, do things together. Also, you'll see a George Barnett offering. Uh, the The numbers do not match. Uh, they've not matched for a while, but now and they still don't match. But what is given is more than our church goal. Uh, so, congratulations to you. Thank you for giving toward our state missions offering. Uh, that helps uh, in many areas in our state. I remind you that some of that goes to disaster relief, Louisiana Baptist disaster relief units uh, that are on call all the time, ready to go, ready to move out at any moment, moment's notice. Uh, and if I'm not sure if they're back from Florida. I do not know. I'd have to check on that. Uh, but I know they served, goodness, over 400,000 400, meals were served through these units. Uh, so we're, it's awesome to be a part of such uh, a ministry as that. Uh, so thank you for giving to that ministry. Uh, this Wednesday is our potluck uh, family meeting. Uh, so come prepared uh, to meet and eat uh, and be a part of that. Let's see, Harvest Day offering is next Sunday, the 13th. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Let me see, did I cover almost everything? I hope I did. I hope I did. All right. If you're visiting with us, there's a portion of your bulletin we'd love for you to fill out, uh, tear that off, place that in the box in the foyer. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Let's begin our time of worship this morning by uh, watching a oper an Operation Christmas Child video uh, that we have for you this morning. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, The work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Isn't it amazing that through a gift box, God has raised up intercessors and preachers? I believe the Lord is reminding us today that even in the midst of this pandemic, we are to look upon the nations, to observe, to be astonished, to wonder, because He is doing something mighty. This calling to serve Jesus in this way uh, is the rallying call. That's the sound of the trumpet, the urgency of this gospel that we get to serve, the urgency that He's calling us to introduce more and more people, more and more children to a, a loving God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Each of you and all of the many volunteers that you represent are the heart and soul and engine driving Operation Christmas Child. During this pandemic, the Lord has continued to encourage and to equip the local church and the body of Christ. The idea that we could have collected more than nine million shoebox gifts around the world in the middle of a pandemic, I believe is miraculous. Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child volunteers are rallying around the opportunity to share the gospel. We're rallying toward National Collection Week 
where we seek to send another set of nearly 10 million gospel opportunities around the world. We still have time, we still have opportunity. The Lord has not returned yet. But we want to keep pushing and going forward and doing whatever we can do to reach more, share with more, equip more to share more. When the mountain seems too big, the challenge seems way too big, the goal is way too big, God will go before us and fight our battles. Now it's time. And Jesus said the fields are not white in four months, they're white today. And we want to we be faithful to that. And that's the opportunity the Lord has given some of his purse and, and the Operation Christmas Child Project. In Deuteronomy, we read that uh, the Lord is our God. He is great, he is mighty, and he is awesome. Let's remember that as we stand and sing together this morning. Would you join me in welcoming the Spirit of the Lord here this morning in our invocation? Most holy and glorious Lord God of the universe, of the earth and the heavens, we present ourselves humbly before the throne and ask to be made vessels to do good to those that do not know you, Lord. Thou hast promised that where two or more are gathered in your name, that you will be in their midst and bless them. In your name we have assembled. In your name we wish to proceed with all our doing. Grant that the world would be better and happier for our having lived in it. We thank you, Father, for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. to the garden of home, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear calling on And the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he tells me I am his 
stay in the garden with him through the night around me be falling but he bids me go through a voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known one of the first duets I ever sang with my father. <laughs> it was for a lady, it was for a lady. I, I realize now that my dad sang certain songs for certain people at times in the congregation. I, she must have requested it. Uh, but Miss, Miss, Mrs. Service was her name, and she served her church. Uh, come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses, we need a place, each one of us, we can shut out all the mess in this world and simply stop and talk to the Lord. This time during this service is set apart as something like that because we close our eyes, we forget who's around us, and we meet with the Lord as we speak with Him. I want you to remember those who are hurting in our community, those who are having some difficulties health-wise in our community, those who are just having troubling times, pray for them. Maybe you have something going on in your own life today that you would like to talk to the Lord about. This is the time to do that. This is the time set apart in our service, in our time of worship, for you to speak to the Lord and with the Lord. I'll voice a prayer in just a few moments, but take some time to talk to him today. Let's pray together this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you so grateful that we can. Lord, we come to you without fear of being stopped. We come to you knowing that your ear hears our voice and your head turns our way. You are ready to hear from your children at all times. And God, we thank you. In fact, we depend on you to be like that toward us. We depend on you to hear us when we cry out to you and when we share with you what's going on in our hearts and in our lives. Father, we need your help. We need your strength every day. And we need the constant reminder of your presence with us. Lord, we live in an interesting time in our world's history, and our nation's history. But Father, the facts never change. You are God. We are your children. We are called to live out before a broken world your love, your forgiveness, your gentleness, your kindness, your patience. Help us, God. Help us as we lived out, live out the fruits of the Spirit to show them, to live them out in such a way that people notice. Not that people have to question, but people notice and know that we belong to you. We've gathered in this place to worship you today, and I pray that that's exactly what happens, that our focus is on you, Lord, that we are, that our ears are open to hearing what you have to say to us through the singing, through the music, through the quiet times, through the times of prayer, through the time 
of the proclamation of your word. Help our ears to be open, our hearts to be open to hearing what you have to say to us. We give you thanks. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's rejoice together this morning as we sing our hymns, beginning with, We Have Come Into His House. <laughs>
Sometimes I think I'm in control And I act so foolishly Facing problems on my own I don't know what's best for me My mistakes at time disturb All the plans you have made Lord, keep me in your will So I won't be in your way And put me where you want to, not where I want to be. If I should ask for things I want, just give me what I need. When I complain from time, Forgive me, Lord, I pray. Lord, keep me in your will. So I won't be in your way. Remind me, Lord, I'm just a glove. In which you place your hand Not my will but thine be done Though I don't understand The best laid plans I've made Somehow always go astray So keep me in your will So I won't be in your way And put me where you want to Not where I want to be If I should ask for things I want Just give me what I need When I complain from time to time Forgive me, Lord, I pray Lord, keep me in your will So I won't be in your way I need you, dear Lord Each and every single day To keep me in your will So I won't get in your way So I won't get in your way. Amen. Wow. What a prayer. What a prayer for all of us to keep in mind. Wow. That was good. Good. Thank you, Sandra. We live that way. We live that way from time to time. We get in his way. Uh, we do what we want to do instead of what he wants us to do, and we wind up messing up. 
messing up big time sometimes. And we must be careful. We must call on him to keep us in his will. I named this uh, sermon, I, I kind of went King James on us here, and uh, I named this, Be Ye Not a Block of Stumbling. Be Ye Not a Block of Stumbling. Now, I was, uh, I, so many of you know, I walk uh, at the park too early in the morning, according to some, uh, to, to, and I get out there and I walk, and there is a portion of the sidewalk. Now, please do not report this to the town. It's not that big a deal. It's, uh, there's a little portion of the sidewalk that is a little higher at one point than another. And I just so happened to put my foot right on that high spot, and I wasn't high enough. And I almost fell. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And they, uh, people I was walking with, you okay? I thought, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, of course, you know, you get embarrassed when you fall, and it's like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. Well, I didn't fall all the way, so I was, I'm good. Uh, but what is a stumbling block, a stumbling block? Well, you, you probably understand what a stumbling block is. It's something that, uh, over which you stumble. It's something over which you stumble, and it's something that uh, causes you to fall or to stumble. Uh, literally, that's what a stumbling block is. But figuratively... For our spiritual education and application today, a stumbling block is something that is an obstruction to spiritual growth and is also a cause or could be a cause of sin. Now these two meanings go hand in hand to what we're looking at today. Uh, and I'm going to ask if you are able to stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God from Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. And the Bible tells us this, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. Heavy words for us as believers today. May God bless the reading of His Word. I invite you to be seated this morning. Very interesting passage of Scripture here. Uh, the first thing that is obvious to me is that the world is full. The world is full of stumbling blocks. The first part of verse 7 says, Woe, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. The word woe is an interjection of grief or denunciation. Literally, it means distress comes or will come upon something or someone. Distress upon the world, distress to the world because of its stumbling blocks. So, Jesus is saying here that distress will come upon the world because of stumbling blocks. Uh, the word, uh, the King James uses the word offenses. Offenses. Both are correct. The Greek word used here means a snare or a stumbling block or an offense. So it's the same thing here. Different words but meaning the same thing. Well, why would Jesus say this? Why would he say that distress will come to the world because of offenses or stumbling blocks? Well, think about it. That which causes another person to stumble can lead that person to falling and being hurt. Literally speaking, the person could wind up in the hospital because of someone else's stumbling, someone else's offense. Someone else's, oh, I just didn't notice the light was red and I ran right through it. Someone, oh, well, nobody's ever coming the other direction at this stop sign. I just was surprised someone was today and I hit them. Spiritual, spiritually speaking, we're looking at something a little different. When a person stumbles spiritually, that person sins. Their spiritual growth is impeded and they are not able to be used by God until the offense, the block of stumbling, is dealt with. The cause of sin must be dealt with. 
Success in coming, becoming more like Jesus cannot happen if we're constantly stumbling over various blocks of sin. Trust me, if you've not already noticed, there are various blocks of sin to stumble over in our world. Our world serves up thousands of stumbling blocks on the television every night of the week. There are also thousands of books which be can become stumbling blocks to us. There are books in our world in abundance that are uh, close but not on target when it comes to being in line with God's Word. They are close but they are just enough removed so that they are not sharing the full truth. It seems to me I remember someone in the Bible that was good at bringing up Bible verses but not revealing the full truth of what they were saying. Seems to me he met Jesus in the wilderness at one point and served up a lot of scripture, the devil did, and Jesus answered him with scripture. So, uh, I think in, in, inside Jesus is thinking, you know, you're not getting me. <laughs> I'm the son of God, you're not getting me, devil, you're not getting me. But there are books out in our world that come close to sounding really good and sounding biblical. And you think, oh, well, this is good. It's got scripture in it, so it must be good. It must be right. And yet, it's not. It comes close, but it's not. And we must be on guard for books like that in our world. Let me say this right now, that the best life you can live does not become reality until you make it to heaven. Just living my best life now. Oh, really? Your best life is going to be when you're in heaven with God who loves you. Your best life is going to be when you're standing before the one who sent his only son into the world to die on a cross for you. That's your best life. This is temporary. Temporary. And so many people get caught up in the temporary, in the material world in which we live. And they, they, they oh, I just got to have this stuff. This stuff's going to make me happy. And it's not. Being in the presence of a God who loves you and a God who made it possible for you to be with him forever and ever, that is living your best life. This world is temporary. The first thing I want us to see again is that there are stumbling blocks in our world, just in case you haven't noticed. There are things in our world that can cause us to stumble spiritually, that can cause us to go down a rabbit hole and be coaxed away and be pulled away from the guidance of God. There are things in this world that are grabbing out for us, reaching out to grab us, reaching out for us to pull us down. And those are stumbling blocks in our world. Another truth from this verse in verse 7, people will experience stumbling blocks. We are going to experience them. They are in the world and we are going to experience them. Just because we are saved, just because we have Jesus in our hearts, does not mean we are immune. We are, dare I say, it doesn't mean we are vaccinated against stumbling blocks. Because they're there, and they will come. They will come. Look at verse 7. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. We will encounter them. We will trip up on some things from time to time. We will be pulled in by the world to thinking certain ways that we should not think, to doing certain things we should not do. We will experience Stumbling blocks, it's part of the world we live in. They're unavoidable. But remember, this is Jesus speaking here. He is very aware of how this world works. He knows and understands that you and I are going to run into stumbling blocks. He knows that when we do and when we sin because of those stumbling blocks, God understands and God knows now, does this mean you can just keep on stumbling? Does this mean we have the freedom? Well, God knows. God knew I was going to sin. I'm just going to do it again. He knows it's going to happen. Why well, can't, you know? Whoa, whoa, whoa. We must remember what God is doing in our lives. 
we must remember that He is molding us into the likeness of Christ. If He's working on us to make us look like and to be like someone we are not, that means we can't continue to do what we should not and expect somehow to be someone we are not. Now, please don't ask me to repeat that. I'm surprised I followed my own line of thinking on that. But I mean, we, we, we get this idea, sometimes people do, let me say that. Well, I sinned once and, well, God didn't strike me off the face of the earth. I'll, I'll, I'm okay, I'll just do this again. But you are being deceived by the, by the very one who is against us, the very one who, that's his job to pull us off course. We're being deceived. One of the, one of the most powerful um, weapons that the devil has, and this is according to C.S. Lewis, and I agree, is his power of deception. Making us think we're all right. Making us think we can sin and it's okay. The devil loves to do that, loves to try to convince us that, well, look, now see, look, you sinned and what happened? Nobody knows. You didn't get struck off the face of the earth. God didn't wipe you out of the, you know, off the planet. You can do it again. It's no big deal. The devil is good at deception. And he will pull us and grab hold of us and pull us the best he can to do that which we should not do. That's his, that's his job. That's what he does. He does it well from time to time. We must be careful but just because God knows and understands that that happens to us does not mean God says, oh, well, you just go ahead. <laughs> you know, sometimes my kids just misbehave, you know. Do you know parents like that? What do you think about their kids? What do you think about their parenting? When you hear, when you see little Johnny throwing rocks at the, at the new car in the parking lot and he, oh, well, boys will be boys. <laughs> you know, they, well, you know, they, they have to have fun. I mean, kids are kids, aren't they? What do you think about that? I don't agree. I don't think that's right. And I certainly do not think that our loving Heavenly Father who sent His Son to die on a cross so that we could be made one with Him in heaven, I certainly don't think God is looking at us saying, Oh, well, it's no big deal. No, He made it possible for us to have our sins forgiven. God expects us to be open to being changed into the likeness of His Son, Jesus. God is looking, saying, look, I'm making you like Jesus, and I'm not going to put up with this kind of stuff. I'm not happy when you sin. I understand, understand that he understands that there are stumbling blocks, and we will stumble from time to time. Know that he knows that. But that does, that's not permission. That's not permission. Just because he knows doesn't mean, oh, we'll just get away with it. It's no big deal. No. No. God loves us too much. To allow us to continue in sin. He loves us too much to allow us to keep tripping up and falling all over ourselves. And falling over stumbling blocks. He loves us too much. I guess my point is that God knows. And He already knows that you will stumble from time to time. And you know what? That should make it easier. That should make it easier for us to go to Him and confess our sin. Have you ever thought about that? The fact that he knows. Can you imagine if he did not know that you had sinned? Think about this. Imagine a God who did not know that you had sinned. You sin and then you have to go to him. How do you feel? Well, I know he's a loving God. I know he's going to forgive me. <laughs> but I'm going to have to confess to him. I'm going to have to tell him something he does not know. I'm going to have to tell him something that he is not going to make him happy. I'm going to have to confess to him that I have sinned against him. And he has no clue that I'm coming. Oh, man. Now, I know that when you got in trouble at school around here, before you even got home, your parents knew. But if, some, if, if by some strange circumstance, some strange happenstance, your parent did not know, the urge inside of you to tell them, they don't know. Why would I tell them? But on the other hand, you know that at some point, they're going to find out. Oh, it's so hard. 
What a hard spot to be in. And yet we serve a God, we have a Heavenly Father who knows that we've sinned and that ought to make it easier for us to go to Him and say, God, and He says, I know, but I want to hear you say it. God, I sinned. I sinned against you. I have sinned against you. Yes, I know. I'm waiting. God, forgive me. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're my child. I love you. But you need to admit that you have sinned. You have got to agree with me as your heavenly father that you have sinned. And once you do that, then let's just work on this and let's get rid of it. Let's repent of it. Let's walk away from this sin. And let's move toward being more like Jesus. Let's do this. And this is our God. No, he's not happy when we stumble. But he's fully aware that we could and that we will. His desire, though, is that we come to him and make things right. The entire reason for stumbling blocks are mentioned uh, is because, the reason they're mentioned is because they interfere, they hamper, they hinder our relationship with God. There should be nothing between you and the Lord. There should be nothing that hampers that relationship, nothing that pulls you off course, nothing that pulls you off the, uh, off the path of becoming more like Jesus, of walking with God. There should be nothing in this world that pulls you apart from the Lord. Is there? That's the question I'm asking myself this morning, that's the question I hope you ask yourself. Is there anything that is pulling you off course? Is there anything that is messing up the relationship that you have with God? If there is, that is a stumbling block in your life. Stumbling blocks are not to be viewed as little mistakes. They bring with them a force that messes with our relationship with God. Stumbling blocks come with such a force that they can tear us away from the Lord in such a way that we feel alienated from Him. What are the facts? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are the facts? The facts are you're one of God's children. The facts are He loves you. The facts are He wants you to come back in relationship with Him. Those are the facts, but we feel like we're so apart from Him that we have to, as I've said before, reintroduce ourselves. Hey, God, remember me? I live on 507 Highland. Uh, uh, yeah, my name's Craig Beeman. Yeah, you remember me? I don't want you to ever feel so separated from God that you feel uncomfortable talking to Him. Oh my, what a horrible feeling to have. We must see. That that's what stumbling blocks do to us. They mess up our relationship. Adrian Rogers once said, The church is a society of sinners who finally admitted it. Wow. The church is a society of sinners who finally admitted it. Sinners who finally admitted that we're sinners. That's how, you, that's how you made it into the family of God. That's how you were accepted by God when you realized, I'm a sinner. Oh my goodness, I have sinned. I have, I have sinned against the God who loves me. I've done something wrong. Oh my goodness, I, when I finally admitted that I was a sinner, I realized I needed a Savior. I needed someone to forgive me of my sins. I needed someone who could make it right between me and God. And that man's name is Jesus. And I need that. We need that. We must admit that we do stumble at times. It does happen. Those blocks of stumbling come to us, and when they do, they will come for us. Remember the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Guess what? He means it. God means it. When he says that, he means that. He means that nothing should come before him. Anything that becomes bigger than God to us is our God. Do not be surprised if you wake up one morning and your attention, your praise, your focus is on something or someone other than God. Don't be surprised. It's part of the sinful world in which we live. And there's sinful influences in our world. And they will grab hold of us and pull us in, its, in their direction. When that morning comes, stop and turn to God. Confess your sin to Him. Get back in right relationship with Him. It's 
So we will experience stumbling blocks. Even though we're saved, even though we're one of God's children, we're going to experience stumbling blocks. They're going to come. And we have to face that fact that sometimes we stumble over those blocks. It happens. The last thing we see, make sure you're not the one. And this is a grave warning here. Make sure you're not the one through which the stumbling block comes. Oh, man. Look at that. Look, look, look at the last part there again. It says, but woe. Oh, there it is again. Distress. Distress. May, but, but distress. May that come to the man through whom the stumbling block comes. But woe. That's distress that comes. It's not used against the world, but it, co- it is against the one through whom a stumbling block comes. It's bad enough that this world says, here's a stumbling block, here's a stumbling block. Everybody gets a stumbling block today. It's bad enough that that's the way our world is. It's bad enough that, that it just throws out stumbling blocks before all, all of us all the time. That's bad enough. Oh, that's bad enough. What's worse, though, is if you are the one through which the stumbling block comes. What's worse is if you're the one that is the stumbling block to someone else. Oh, man. In Romans, Paul is writing about that coming time when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and give praise to God. He says in chapter 14, verses 12 through 13, So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Wow. The way we speak, the words we use, the way we act, the way we react, they're all important to the health of those around us. You see, we are so connected. We're connected more than we would ever think we were in this world. People that you don't know, know you. They know who you are. They may have never walked up and talked to you. They've never walked up to you to speak to you. They've never, they've never ha- served on a board or, or a committee with you. They've never been working with you out in the community. They may have never had an experience with you, but they know who you are. And they're watching. They're watching. We're never to be or to put, our, put others in a place in a situation that gives them an opportunity to stumble. Woe to the one who does. Woe to the one who does. I see the herd mentality sometimes. Well, let's just talk about that uh, Tennessee game a few weeks ago where the fans got, quote, unquote, carried away, just a little carried away. They damaged property on the field. They picked up the goal post. Oh, well, it's okay. They paid for it. It's okay. Don't make excuses for bad behavior. But when there were some who went along and started rocking the goal and started and, and made it come down, and others said, oh, yeah, others came along with them and helped. What you do affects other people. And you think, well, oh, well, now, I, no, Brother Craig, I'm not all that important. I'm not, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself in these situations. What you do need to think about yourself is, I'm an example of a child of God. That's what you do. That does matter. That's what you should keep in the forefront of your mind when you're out in the community. I'm a child of God. How am I representing him today? How are people seeing Jesus through me? How are they seeing him through me? And the way we act and react, the words we say, the things we do, all of that reflects on Christ. And it matters. And we don't want to steer someone in a wrong direction, a bad direction. We don't want to be the one who is who, who, who through the stumbling block comes. We do not want to be that person. We do not want to be that person. Listen to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have 
there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. This is to the church in Pergamum. In Pergamum, as elsewhere, teachers had entered the churches, sought to persuade the members to act freely on the acknowledged truth that Christians were not under the Mosaic law. The concept of a permissive society is clearly not new, and neither are its evils. Oh my. Yeah, you're not under law, so go do whatever you want. Oh, that's not what God intends. As believers, we should never be the one who hinders or hampers in any way another person's relationship with God. Just because we are free in Christ does not mean we have freedom to just go and sin some more. We should go and sin no more. We're to point people to God, not away from God. Sometimes our actions and our words say that we're not leaning on the direction of God. And people notice that. Sometimes it might be difficult for others to see Jesus in us because of what we're saying or what we're doing. We must be careful to show Him in us at all times. Allow Him to be in control. It means we allow the Holy Spirit to overtake our words and our actions. To overtake our own feelings if necessary. That's sometimes very difficult to do, but it is possible to do. I tell you, I stand before you and tell you it is possible. It's possible. Will you let him guide you? Will you let him be in control of your life? There are stumbling blocks in our world. We're going to experience them. But you and I must be ever so careful to not be the one through which a stumbling block comes. We don't want to be, as they say, that guy we don't want to be that one that causes others to stumble we watch we're careful we seek to be Christ to others in all things let's pray dear heavenly father we thank you oh God we thank you for your love for us we thank you for your care for us and Lord, by showing, in showing our thankfulness, Father, may we give our lives fully to you in such a way that we allow you to use us in this world. Maybe somebody's here today and they're thinking, boy, I, 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 I think I may have been a stumbling block to someone. I would just simply ask that you talk to the Lord about that. Get right with him on that. Deal with that. Don't let it slide by. Don't listen to the devil telling you, oh, it was not that big of a deal. Because it is. It is. As children of God, we must be careful to show the love of Christ. God, I'm thankful that you are aware that stumbling blocks come our way. I'm glad, so thankful to know that you know when we fall. You know when we stumble over them. And you're ready to forgive us. I thank you for that. Father, if there's someone here this morning that just is thinking, you know, I've not, I, I've never given my life to Jesus. I've, I've, I've never allowed him to be in charge of my life. Maybe today you need to make that decision to follow him. Maybe today's the day that you give your life over to him and say to God, oh God, I am a sinner. I've sinned. I want to repent. I want to turn away from my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. I want you to be in charge of my life. I, I, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. To be my Savior. Maybe today you need to make that decision. Would you do that? Maybe you still have questions about that. Don't put it off. Come talk with me. Talk with someone that you're comfortable with about what it means to follow Jesus. Don't put it off, please. This world is in need of people who live as God's children, as, who live as people that belong to God, that simply live out who they say they are. Father, we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
We're going to sing a hymn of response. Have thine own way, Lord. Let's stand together as we sing. You come as the Lord leads you to come. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art my As you leave this place this morning, um, I, I, I feel like sometimes we, we, we leave going, uh, just we're on high alert after something like this, and we should be, I guess, watching for stumbling blocks. But I would encourage you to, to look to Jesus and know that they're out there, know that they will come, know that you will experience one and you may stumble, but keeping your eyes on Jesus. That's where our focus should always be. As you leave this place this morning, leave knowing that God follows you out this door. He is with you and He loves you. He loves you so much. And so does this little preacher. You're dismissed. Mom.